welcome to my channel. Today's video is going to be a true crime video and I'm going to be talking about Enron. Now Enron was a huge scandal back in 2001 and I was too young to understand what was happening there. Um, my family watched the news every morning and the evening too, so I heard it a lot and I really didn't understand what the deal was. You know, it was a company that failed and there were all these images on the news of like people leaving this fancy building with like boxes of stuff and to me I was like, okay, sometimes companies fail, like what's the deal? But Enron um, has kind of a legacy, it kind of stuck in the American consciousness and it's 20 years later and I wanted to find out why. So um, here's what I can tell you about why Enron was such a huge deal when it happened. It was the biggest corporate bankruptcy in the world until that point. Um, the financial collapse in 2008 uh, beat it, I think, by a lot. But up until that point, it was the biggest um, bank corporate bankruptcy in the world. Um, in America, Enron was the seventh largest corporation by revenue. So that's huge. Um, I was looking up the seven largest companies now by revenue and it's like Walmart, Amazon, Apple, CVS, ExxonMobil. So like imagine if one day Walmart just didn't exist. Now Walmart's number one, but it's kind of on a similar scale. Like you wake up one morning and it's gone and someone tells you, oh yeah, the whole thing, the books were cooked, it was a Ponzi scheme, like it wasn't real. That would be really shocking and confusing. Um, the share price collapsed pretty quickly, so it went from $90 to nothing over like one year. Um, and it started slow, 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 and it was just this slow decline from $90, and then the final collapse went from like $40 to zero in 24 days. Um, and then the, the final reason this was such a big deal and in the news, beyond the fact that it became apparent there was a lot of crime involved, was that the CEO of the company was close family friends with the Bush family, both Bush Sr. and Bush Jr. who was in office in 2001. So there was like all these questions of uh, you know, like, was Bush covering for him, or was there some sort of political scandal here? That never came to anything. Um, that, as far as I know, there was never really any fire underneath the smoke of inappropriateness with the president. Um, but they were close family friends, so that, that was kind of a whole thing. Um, okay, so... Let's talk about the major players. There are three men who I am going to talk about the most. Um, all in all, um, over, I think, 16 people went to prison for this. I'm going to talk about three of them, although one of them isn't counted among the 16, and I'll tell you why at the end. Um, but the first guy to know is named Andy Fastow. Fastow. And he was kind of the fall guy. Um, he did perpetrate the crimes. Um, he was sort of like the head of the crime division in Enron. So I'm not saying that he was a patsy or that he was innocent. But in making him the head of the crime division, the CEO and um, his second-in-command, who was also briefly CEO, they were able, or they tried, to say, like, we didn't know what he was doing. 
you know, he bamboozled us. He was doing crime. It was all him. And he did not go down without a fight. So that's Fasto. And he did personally enrich himself quite a bit from the scheme. So unlike um, the other two guys I'm going to talk about, he personally made money from the crime specifically versus the um, other results of the crime, which was to artificially inflate the worth of the company. Okay, so next up we've got skilling. Skilling um, is probably the actual mastermind of the crime. Um, you know, Fast House, the one who did it, he always claimed that skilling came up with the idea. Regardless, um, this was a man who very much believed in his own cleverness and I really thought that he would win, I guess. Um, I wasn't surprised to learn that prior to working for Enron, he gambled a lot in the stock market and lost a lot. I think he was in a lot of debt. And that didn't surprise me because a lot of his actions at Enron were risky, um, foolish, maybe. I mean, given that he went to prison, yeah. Um, and amoral, possibly immoral. So he has always claimed innocence. Um, and I think, I mean, the jury didn't believe it, and I think it's a lot of bull, and we'll get to that later. But he, he definitely, um, you know when there's like a king and like an evil viceroy? He's definitely got that evil viceroy vibe where he's like, I know how to solve this problem, but it won't be legal. Like he just sort of, it's very cutthroat and very like, we're gonna... We're gonna get it done no matter the cost, and the cost is crime. And the final guy I want to talk about is the CEO of Enron, um, Ken Lay. And Ken Lay became the CEO in 1985. Um, he has a P had a PhD in economics. Like I said, he was a close family friend of both Bush Sr. and Bush Jr. because he was like a Texas oil guy, so that's the connection there. Um, he was super, super anti-regulation. He wanted energy and natural gas to be entirely deregulated. That was like his life's goal. His PhD in economics told him that if oil was deregulated, then oil men would make tons of money. He was right, um, but, you know... And get at what cost? And then, of course, that's not exactly what happened with Enron for lots of reasons. Mostly because of skilling. No, well, it's hard to say. So one issue I've had with a lot of the sources that I've read about Enron and the collapse is Ken Lay kind of gets a pass. People act like, oh, he was CEO, but he didn't know what his underlings were doing, or they kind of act like, you know, maybe he was just like a bumbling old man. He wasn't that old. Or, you know, maybe he was kind of stupid. Like, there are... The interpretations, I think, are really, really sympathetic to him versus skilling and fast out. And I really reject this um, for two reasons. And the first is what happened before skilling even worked at Enron. So, in the 80s, Enron had its first scandal in 1987, so Enron had only existed as Enron for two years before it got in trouble for doing some illegal stuff, and basically he had these two oil traders who were doing illegal oil trading. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail about this one because it, it's not super important to what happened later, but... It, it does speak to Ken Lay and his sense of morality and his sense of how to do business, which were both pretty bad because these two oil traders, um, you know, did some illegal stuff. They did some like risky betting that they shouldn't have done. 
and you know somehow they were always winning and when they got in trouble you know people told Ken Lay like you've got these rogue oil traders um, you know offshore accounts phony books all this stuff they're doing to to try to make money Lay's response was to send them a letter and there, the letter we saw the letter and one of the key sentences in it was he wrote to them keep making us millions like he didn't fire them he basically promoted them despite the fact that they were using an illegal scheme to enrich themselves and to enrich Enron and then you know because what they were doing was so risky they you know bet the house and lost so they they ended up failing at gambling at, at that point they ended up um, out of Enron so this to me like this is before skilling this is before anything Ken Lay was very much a make money at any cost kind of guy um, very much didn't care what they had to do didn't care about the law or or the riskiness of what they were doing and he just said you know if it makes me money do it which is a very very bad way to live for many I mean gambling is risky anyone can tell you and so I've kind of um I've kind of gotten ahead of myself what is, what is Enron what was Enron well in 1985 it was a natural gas pipeline company it was actually you know when it was formed I think it was a merger of a couple different companies and then they came together and called themselves Enron and hired on Ken Lay as CEO and that's what they did they delivered natural gas to people people are always going to need natural gas so it's a pretty steady job pretty steady commodity um and that wasn't really good enough for ken lay he didn't want three percent growth he didn't want you know simple steady growth and a good the system we provide a service people buy it from us that is not he wanted deregulated oil deregulated energy that he could then essentially game the system to make as much money as possible and so he hired on skilling in 1989 and um, skillings main contribution I'm gonna say because it wasn't illegal and it did help the company was that he pioneered gas as a commodity for futures trading and if you are not familiar with futures trading I highly recommend watching the Eddie Murphy movie trading places which is just a fantastic movie um, and it, it really it's just a good movie in general but it also explains futures trading and then it sort of gets on, on not exactly white collar crime but it is like this ragtag group of people come together to um you know screw over some millionaire old dudes who are awful so um they explain uh, the, the old dudes who are called the duke brothers explain futures trading to eddie murphy um where commodities are things like agricultural products and gold and you basically predict if you think the price is going to go up or the price is going to go down in the future so if you think the price is going to go down in the future you want to sell your commodities now if you think the price is going to go up in the future you want to buy um, in the Eddie Murphy movie it's orange juice you want to buy orange juice now when it's cheap and then sell it later at a higher price and there's some um, scheming you can do with this but the key point here is that by pioneering gas futures trading at Enron Enron was acting as the broker so um, whether people lost or gained money on their futures trading Enron made money as the broker and that was key they were the only person doing this at the time so they had a monopoly on gas futures trading okay so skilling began to make Enron a lot of money um, through this monopoly on gas futures trading and because now part of their company was just futures trading um, they had kind of that 
late 80s and then going into the 90s, like Wall Street broker competitive culture. I mean, it was very high on sexism, for example, pretty skeevy. Um, the men and a few women who worked for him called themselves Skillingites. Um, they also had really weird, like, cutthroat and, and cruel policies where they would vote on, like, who to fire, and Skilling believed that you should fire, like, 15% of your people every year, which, um, no company has ever done something like that that I'm aware of. It's a really, really bad policy. You have really high turnover, people who don't trust each other, who will backstab each other. Um, yeah, so uh, that's the kind of culture going on in Enron, and I really think that feeds into the crime that happened and why so many people let it happen. The other really, really big thing for Enron is they were obsessed with their stock price. Um, more so, I'm led to believe more so than other companies. I don't know this for sure. I've never worked in this kind of company. Um, but, you know, they, they, all, they all bought stock to put in their pension plans. Like a lot of Enron workers, their pension plans were two-thirds Enron stock. So for them, it really did matter that the stock price went up. They were enriching themselves. They were preparing for their future. Um, and the higher-ups, of course, had a lot of stock options, too. So it made sense, but the way the way they talked about it seemed a little weird to me. Um, just, you know, having these big all-hands meetings and talking about their stock price. But again, I have not worked in this kind of company, so maybe that happens. I don't know. Um, and then the other bigger thing to keep in mind is we're now into the 90s and there's a huge stock boom, um, especially the early 90s and, um, you know, the late 90s, there's a sort of tech collapse and some issues there, but for most of the 90s, you know, wealth is pouring in, people are getting rich, and Enron felt the pressure to show returns of 15% or more, which is... Um, again, for a natural gas company, that's not normal. That's, um, that's not the kind of growth you have in, in that sector. So, um, it's what they wanted. Uh, yeah, it was unrealistic, but it's what they wanted, and it's what they were going to get at all costs. And the way they did it was, um, at the beginning, through... Again, we're still we're still on the legal side of things. We haven't gotten to the crime yet. Um, although nowadays, I think this doesn't happen. So I think that like after Enron, everyone's like, "This was a bad idea, and we never should have let it happen to begin with." So um, and what the thing was that was a bad idea is called mark to market accounting, and this works for some businesses. But it's not usually used in businesses that provide a product. Okay, so what is mark-to-market accounting? It, um, it allowed Enron to include future projected profits in their current financial statements. So profits they had not yet made from selling gas or whatever. So Enron could say, okay plan on making a deal um, with this state and we think from that deal we'll make $200 million so we're going to say this quarter we made $200 million if the plan falls through um, then they didn't make that $200 million so that was already a problem um, and beyond that um, th there were some checks and balances in how this, this happens, but these were very competitive people who were projecting profits, so they had a lot of incentive to project the best possible outcome, which means they were always going to project, you know, like, the highest 
prophets. So it really shouldn't be surprising that they often fell short. Um, and again, I want to say that this, this mark to market accounting, um, they had to be approved by their out of house accounting service and by the SEC. And that kind of comes into play later. Enron did have accountants and, and auditors from, you know, not from the outside, which companies have to have. And those auditors did not do their job. Um, but regardless, they were doing this mark to market accounting. And I think it also, just from the start, this was going to always cause problems for them. Because again, you're projecting future profits, which means next year you can't claim those profits on your financial sheet. You have to project the next year's profits. Um, so it was always kind of this ball rolling downhill. But again, when they realized they couldn't control that problem, they solved it with crime. There were ways to stop the ball. There were ways to stop this from getting out of hand. It would have just resulted in their stock price not rising, fluctuating, maybe falling on occasion, but being not as valuable as they wanted it to be. And this was unacceptable to these very competitive and greedy men. Um, okay, so based on what's come out, the crimes start in 1993. So not that much later from when Skilling started the mark to market, which would have been like 1990, 1989. So already in four years, this system has backfired and they have to start doing crime. So, um, the crimes themselves, because it's white collar crime, because these men, I want to say they weren't stupid, but I, you know, they all went to prison. Um, I think stupidity comes in different flavors. So in general, they were, they were familiar with how their, um, you know, they, they knew how to work the system. And so Fastow starts doing illegal accounting. And the way this all works is they started creating special purpose entities or special purpose vehicles. They're more commonly known as. And these are normally legitimate um, offshoots of companies, but they also are a place where crime can be committed, as is what happened here. Um, and what they did was they basically made all these companies and then they loaned Enron money from these companies. And so these companies would give a huge loan to Enron, like $200 million dollars. That company didn't necessarily have $200 million to loan to Enron, so they would start going bankrupt or whatever. They, you know, they were now liable for this loan that Enron didn't have the money to pay back, because that's the whole point why they made them. Um, and so it was sort of like a way of hiding debt. So if Enron was a billion dollars in debt, they'd put like $200 million over here, $200 million over here, and they would hide the debt in these offshoots that were not Enron, technically, and so didn't show up on their financial statements. And to make it worse, they would report the loans that they got as profit. So basically what they're doing is they're loaning themselves money. You know, I'm giving me $4 and then I'm saying I profited $4, even though to do that loan, you know, I had to f make up $4 by getting a loan elsewhere, like from the bank. So it didn't make any sense, but they used a really complicated system to move money from here to here to here to here, back to Enron. And then Enron's going to say, we made a profit. And the losses then are not reported on financial statements. Now, Fasto made a lot of money doing this because he created um, he created a, a company basically to manage all of these SPVs or SPEs, and he was the head of that company, 
which was a huge conflict of interest, but he was the head of that company, and so he was making essentially brokerage fees. Um, and so beyond all the Enron money, he made $45 million from running this other little company um, that was the crime company. And, um, and I'll be honest, I'm not a business person. I am a scientist. I read about this a lot, but there are some details that, that I am a little confused on. Um, so I, I might not get this 100% accurate, but my understanding, um, that was my understanding of how it worked. And again, the, the reason that LJM, this other company that Fast I was in charge of, was such a conflict of interest was because when you are in charge of a company, your main goal should be the benefit of that company. If, if Enron put me in charge of an SPV, then I no longer think of Enron as like the most important thing. That SPV now and the, the welfare of that SPV is now my goal. I want to make the best deals for that SPV. I want to make sure it doesn't go bankrupt. That's how it's supposed to work. What Fast Out did is he still worked for Enron. He was pretty high up. I can't remember if he was CFO um, or just below the CFO, but he, you know, was an important dude at Enron. But he was also in charge of this company that he tanked. He didn't care at all if it went under because the whole point of the company was to hide Enron's debt and make Enron look like a better company. And that's the conflict of interest. And that is um, eventually one of the ways it started unraveling. It wasn't even like the illegal debt hiding. It was the like people suddenly noticed like, wait, fast I was involved in two companies. That's a conflict of interest and we don't feel confident that he's doing a good job in his role. What's going on here? But I'm getting ahead of myself. This was 1993. None of that happens till we reach the next millennium. Um, here's an example of how FastOwes um, SPEs would work. Let's say the company, which again is a power oil gas company, invested in a new power plant. Um, they would use their mark to market accounting to immediately claim a profit based on their projections for how much power people are going to buy. And that's before they'd even recoup a single dime. So they bought this power plant. They think, okay, we're going to make this much money from the power plant. We would write that down in our financials, instantly profitable. So then if they don't make that profit or worse, they make a loss, um, you know, now, now they have a problem. They bought this power plant and they haven't recouped their losses. They would transfer, transfer the power plant to an SBE. Um, and then Enron had already claimed a profit that didn't exist and the loss was hidden and not reported on financial statements because now that power plant didn't belong to Enron. It belonged to an SBE. So yeah. I mean, they, they made a profit that didn't exist, and then they hid the bunk power plant. They would also, like, sell things to each other, um, like sell the power plant back to Enron, or sell it for cheaper, or they did some um, stock stuff that was bad, where, like, the SPEs, you know, were basically made of Enron stock, and then they would sell stock back to Enron at like cheaper than they should have, you know, I mean, basically this whole thing where the person in charge of the SPE should have been looking out for the welfare of the SPE. That's the whole point. Like it's supposed to be an individual separate company, but instead they were just puppets that were being pummeled in order to make Enron look profitable, which it wasn't. This goes on for a while and Enron under skilling Ken Lay is still the CEO, but Skilling isn't interested in being an energy company. He he likes ideas more than he likes stuff, so selling oil or selling gas is kind of boring to him. He wants to do the new innovative thing. He wants to be, you know, he wants to have the billion dollar idea all the time. They're actually doing a lot of pretty bad deals during this time. They're trying to like, you know, they, they want monopolies 
and to have a monopoly, you need to have a new idea before anyone else does. Because at this point, um, you know, other people are like, well, we can also be gas futures traders. So they're no longer a monopoly there. And so they're kind of just going in every direction, trying to figure out like what they can do to be the best. Um, and they weren't, you know, they were doing badly and people in the company kind of knew it, but they weren't really sure. Like, how is it we keep missing our targets? But then like the quarter rolls around and we somehow made our targets. Like what's happening? Um, and the answer of course is cooking the books. And then in the year 2000, um, California happened and I want to make this clear. Enron and everyone who got arrested from Enron and went to prison, none of this has to do with what they did in California. What they did in California was morally repugnant and disgusting and greedy, but nobody got in trouble for it. So this is kind of like a random aside. And the only reason we know so much about it is because of the eventual collapse of Enron all these tapes came out of phone conversations with the, the California guys for Enron. So let's talk about Enron in California. As I've mentioned, um, Ken Lay was very pro deregulate natural gas, deregulate oil, deregulate energy. And in 2000, California had done that more or less. They had deregulated. So Enron moves in and so did some other companies. And I've heard the claim that other companies were engaged in exactly the same practices as Enron. It's just that Enron stuff came out in the end. Um, but I, I haven't really looked into that. So in two, the year 2000, California had an energy crisis. And I want to be clear, this energy crisis was entirely manufactured. There was no crisis. California produced enough energy for California. California had a surplus of energy. That was not the problem. It was never the problem. What happened was um, this guy, Belden, I've got a fourth player here. This guy named Belden was in charge of the Enron in California. And he read up all the rules, um, all the sort of arcane system of how energy is works in California, the pipelines, how things move, how you can order energy or stop energy, whatever. And he realized that he could just lie to California. So he could call and say, Hey, California, uh, we're predicting that tomorrow you're going to need a lot more energy. So we're going to need to use some pipelines and we want to use these pipelines and they all just happen to belong to Enron. Um, he could jam up the pipelines so that he could say, okay, I want all my energy to only go through this tiny, tiny pipeline that can't hold it. And then California would be like, wait, but there's not enough. Like we can't move it fast enough. And he would be like, well, I guess you'll have to pay extra to use this other pipeline that belongs to me or it's a blackout. You know, he would purposefully shut down, um, all of the power plants that belong to Enron. And so California would then scramble and be like, wait, there's no power, you know, and then they'd have to import it from again, Enron power plants out of state, which costs a lot more. They had all of these schemes that were all dubiously legal, definitely immoral. And they named them things like fat boy, death star and get shorty. So, um, they knew, like they knew what they were doing and they, I've listened to some of the calls. Um, they were having fun. These guys were causing blackouts across California. Like imagine schools and hospitals, hospitals have backup generators and then, but you know, it's still scary. Um, people's homes, they don't have lights. People got stuck in elevators. There wasn't power. And then of course everyone's power bills went up by like 200, 300%, maybe more, and your average person, like, they can't afford that. And again, there was power. There was no need for any of this. This was pure greed. Um, so 
Uh, to make this worse, this is where it does maybe get a little political. Which, so in 2001, you know, Bush becomes president, Bush Jr. And he, once they realize what's happening, because a lot of this was happening in like late 2000, like December, this was going on over the winter. Um, in 2001, Bush Jr. is president. The, the feds refused to step in and regulate or figure out what was going on. They were just like, I don't know, like, California has to deal with California. It is what it is. And so eventually the Democratic Senate forced the issue. Um, and just a super random result of this, because it was such a disaster. Um, the governor of California was recalled. And then that's when we got Arnold Schwarzenegger as the governor of California. So that was just like a random <laughs> aside. Um, and Enron... You know that that their headquarters is in Houston. They claimed that oh, the reason California is having problems is because they still have some regulation, and if they had fully deregulated, there would be no problems at all, which is not true. It's a complete lie. They would have just done it, but worse. Um, they made fun of California. They told jokes about California, um, and so predictably. Belden, who did all of this, thought he might get in trouble because, like, they really, I mean, they named these things Death Star, you know, like, they knew it wasn't appropriate or good or moral, but it was the only part of Enron that was profitable because of all of these schemes. So, very predictably, he got promoted. Um, lest you think everything is terrible always, though, Skilling got a pie to the face for this. So, um, I did get a picture, not a great picture, but a woman did throw a pie in California. He went to California and a woman threw a pie in his face. So, get wrecked, Skilling. Okay, so as we're in the year 2000 and the California stuff is going on, here's where Enron is at as a company. Um, Enron is seen as really reliable. It's really reliably growing has 20% returns every year, which is remarkable. That's so good. Who wouldn't want to invest? Fantastic. Um, it was voted, or Fortune Magazine declared it America's most innovative company six years in a row, including the year 2000. Actually, I think they might have included the year 2001, which is the year the company collapsed. It's kind of embarrassing for Fortune Magazine. Um, but they were very proud of this. They were the most innovative um, they kind of bullied stock analysts, so this was not illegal, though it maybe should be. If, if any stock analyst said, you know, Enron's not great, actually, or like, I'm not sure this company is as good as everyone thinks it is. And would then threaten not to do business with whoever they were affiliated with. So if a stock analyst worked for JP Morgan, they'd be like, well, we're done with JP Morgan. And JP Morgan's like, no, we want your money. You get us a lot of business. So the stock analysts were kind of pressured to keep saying, oh yeah, Enron's fantastic. We love Enron. Everyone should buy, buy, buy. Um, and this did happen. Enron got a stock analyst fired from Merrill Lynch. And once he was fired, um, they did like an important deal with Merrill Lynch and the stock, the, the investment bankers all made a bunch of money. So like, this is something that actually happened. This was, and I doubt Enron was or is the only company who does this. I'm sure this happens all the time. Um, another random thing with Enron in the year 2000 is they tried to make a deal with Blockbuster. They were trying to get into broadband and they tried to make a deal with Blockbuster to create streaming video. And again, this is the year 2000, and while it was a smart idea, obviously everyone wanted streaming video, the, the technology just simply wasn't there yet, and the deal fell through, except that um, Enron still claimed the profits on their financial report. Um, so that was a whole thing Blockbuster got uh, somehow pulled into the whole Enron nonsense. So, okay, now we're moving into the downfall of Enron. We've got this house of cards where they're claiming profits that don't exist. They are hiding all of their debt in these SPEs and just shifting money around. 
they are sacking California and just taking it for everything it's worth and it's still not enough to prop up this company. Um, and so in the summer of 2000, the stock price is at an all time high. It's at, um, over $90 and the company kept saying like, you know, let's get it to a hundred. We think it's going to be 130. We think it's going to be 140. However, and this again is where I think, um, some of the things I listened to or read were a little too nice to skilling and Ken lay at this point when the stock price is at its highest, I mean, they know it's a house. They start selling their stock. I mean, that's the thing. They're telling everyone, like, we're we're such a great company. We're going to get to over $120 stock price. They start selling their stock um, at the height of it. And they, um, you know, and because they're selling their stock, I don't think it's known at this point. When you sell stock, it doesn't say, like, oh, this guy sold his stock. You just know there is more stock available. That drives the price down. So the stock price starts to fall slowly. Um, in February of 2001, Kenley retires and Skilling is made CEO. Okay, good for him. So now Skilling is the CEO. And then in March of 2001, this is the funniest thing to me. It's possible that Enron would have been discovered for what it is anyway. But it seems, it really does seem like the first thing that happens is a reporter with Fortune magazine named Bethany McLean asks the question, how does Enron make its money? And, you know, I mentioned before it's an energy company, but at this point they had sold a lot of their pipelines and natural gas and stuff. Um, and they're trying to get into broadband and they had this like failed venture in water. They wanted to sell water. It didn't work. So, you know, Bethany McLean is writing this article for fortune magazine and she's just like, like, what do they do? Like, what is Enron doing? How are they making money? So she calls them and she asks and, um, Ken, now it was skilling skilling is just like, and I'm not just like, shut up. Like I'm not dealing with this, but then they realized this is a problem, right? Someone's asking questions and they send out a bunch of execs, about three execs, including fast out to go meet with Bethany McLean in New York. And for three hours, she and her, her colleagues are like, but, but how do you make money? Like, it's a simple question. And they kept comparing themselves to Toyota. And she's like, Toyota makes cars. What do you make? And they wouldn't answer. And they kept saying, like, that's proprietary information. And it's like, no, it's not. Like, Coca-Cola makes Coke. Toyota makes cars. What does Enron do? What do you sell? Um, so she wrote an article that was pretty meek. Like, it wasn't actually all that critical. But it was, it was also a question, is Enron overpriced? Like, it's not even a big statement of, like, Enron's garbage. It was just, is Enron good? How do they make their money? Um, and this apparently, based on how the story has been told in, in various mediums I've looked at, was enough for other people to start asking questions and go, wait. Are they overpriced? How do they make their money? Um, so in April, so again, February, Kenley retires. March, Bethany McLean publishes this story. April, they have one of those conference calls with investors, you know, and, um, I forget who it was. Was it Stubbs is his name? Anyway, this guy asks, um, you know, can I see the balance sheet for Enron? And Skilling is like, no you can't. And then he calls him a bad name, which was super inappropriate. Like, yeah, and these are your investors. These are people you need to have confidence in you. And he called him a bad name, like in public on a public conference call. So the stock is continuing to decline slowly. Um, and based on, you know, people who are in the company, like, People were stressed. They didn't understand why the stock was declining. 
the pressure was super, super high as always. There was just always a pressure to make money, make money, and nothing was working. Everyone's stressed out. And then, with no preparation at all, August 14th, Skilling, the CEO, quits. And this is a big deal. Most big companies, the CEO doesn't quit without, like, picking a successor and having, like, propaganda about how good the successor is and how we're in good hands and, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Normally, there's, like, you want things to be, like, as steady and smooth as possible to be, like, you know, our company is so great, we're so great, we're doing good stuff, and I'm retiring because, you know, whatever, my reasons. But that's not what happened. Skilling didn't do any of that. He just quit. People found out, like, on their lunch break, they got, you know, emails or whatever we were doing in 2000 to get news, Blackberries. So that um, was sort of the beginning of the end for Enron. For Enron. Um, that was a huge blow to the company. There were a couple other things that happened. There were internal whistleblowers. So there was one woman named Sharon Watkins, and she was part of this book that um, Bethany McLean helped write. And I think one well, helped write. She's a co-author. I'm not trying to say she wasn't an author. She was an author, but I think there was another author on it. Um, she discovered like one of the SPVs had all this debt. I don't think she discovered how many there were, but she was like, she was an accountant and she was like, um, this isn't right and we're liable for all this debt. And that's actually a huge problem. And she wrote a memo, an internal memo saying like, Hey, there's some problems here and we need to right the ship. Now she believed, she believed in Enron. She didn't realize the extent of the corruption and she thought it was like a matter of, um, fixing some past financial statements, just something you can do. You can like do a restatement and say, we were wrong about the numbers when we come clean, we lied. Well, you wouldn't say that you lied, right? For PR purposes. But she, um, you know, that didn't really come to anything. Ken Lay hired some lawyers who were really just lackeys who showed up and did like an investigation and they were like, no, everything's fine. You're just overreacting, you woman. So, um, the other thing that happened was people became aware of LJM, which I mentioned earlier. It was Fasthouse's other company that had a huge conflict of interest. And the Wall Street Journal began reporting on LJM, LJM um, I think, starting again at the end of summer. So I'm not sure exactly when they figured it out. Um, so, it's like the writing's on the wall. Once, once people started looking at LJM... Um, on October 23rd, Enron's accounting firm shreds a literal ton of paper. Like, they realized they were involved in a lot of shady things, that they had given the okay for a lot of shady things, and more than that, they had actively helped do the shady things. Because, of course, for, um to create all those companies, like they needed the outside auditor, the outside accountants to, to do stuff, to okay it, to sign off on it. So, um, you know, that's bad. And then on December 2nd, 2001, Enron is declared bankrupt. So, um, August 24th, Skilling retires, and then it's just like this death spiral of, of people revealing like thing after thing that they did, just the house of cards crumbling. Um, so on December 2nd, um, people show up and are told, pack up your stuff and go. So, um, if we look at the stock price, and this is, this is enraging. <laughs> if we look at the stock price, um, we can see it slowly declining. Here's 8.23, so again, about when, um, about when Skilling retired retired. He fled a sinking ship. Um, and then we've got this slight increase in, in, um, October and there was some shady stuff that happened here too. So Ken Lake came back to become CEO again. Um, and he, you know, talked a big talk and had these all hands on deck meetings. And then his wife sold a bunch of stock 
and then 10 minutes later they revealed that the company was worthless and then boom it went to zero and um again as i mentioned before while the stock was at its peak the higher ups like fast house skilling and lay and i'm sure and a couple other guys who knew the jig was up they sold their stock for hundreds of millions of dollars each i mean they they yeah they were worth hundreds of millions of dollars each while continuing to tell their employees to buy stock and put in their pension plans um and then when the stock price began sort of plummeting and everyone lost confidence in the company the higher ups froze the website where people could control their pension plans so that so that they could not sell their stock the higher ups made it impossible for them to sell their stock while they were continuing to dump their own and you know this is people who didn't do any crimes this included people who were just involved in like hr or you know people um who worked for the power plants people who delivered energy people across the country who worked for companies that had been bought up by Enron and their jobs were just, you know, to do something legitimate and their pensions got wrapped up in the stock price of Enron and they lost their entire retirement because of this. Um, anecdote, my dad actually had a friend who almost had this happen. He was a chemical engineer. His company was um, bought by Enron in the late 90s and in the year 2000 he would, you know he had all these stock options they, his pension plan was now wrapped up in Enron and he was like I don't love this company I don't know about this it all seems sketchy and he sold it all in 2000 so you know lucky him most people weren't so lucky their companies got bought and they believed the higher ups who sold them this deal um yeah so that was the downfall of Enron and again it would kind of be like seeing Walmart or Apple um, be what it is right now and then a year from now it doesn't exist like you know six months from now someone says hmm Apple's profits don't actually make sense they're not making phones anymore they don't have like they no longer own anything profitable what's going on there and then six months after that you've learned they've been lying about their profits for 10 years it's it's very bizarre. I think it really shocked people. Um, okay. So what happened to our three major players? Again, there was Fasto, who did all the crime for sure. Skilling, who to this day claims he didn't do any crime. And Ken Lay, who everyone kind of acts like was too stupid to have done the crime. Um, so Fasto. Fasto was the first one to come under suspicion. He was the first one to be arrested. And at first he was like, no, I'm innocent. No, no, no. And then it turns out he involved his wife in the crime. Um, she was guilty of tax fraud. And so the Fed said, we're going to throw your wife in jail. At which point, fast, I was like, okay, I'll plead guilty. I'll tell you everything you want to know about these other scumbags who work with me. His wife did do a year in prison. Um, so she, she didn't get off scot-free. But um, Fastow ended up, um, he pled out for six years in prison and he forfeited $23 million. So he's been released. He was released in 2011 and he now does like unpaid talks about financial corruption. And I know he talks a bit about the financial collapse, um, but he's living his life. So that was Fastow. He, um, he flipped which, you know, good for him because he was really, really mad when everyone was just saying Fasto did all the crime, everything bad that ever happened was because of Fasto. Um, in 2004, Skilling was charged with insider trading and conspiracy to defraud investors. Again, he's always said he was innocent. Um, and again, I would remind everyone that when the stock price was still high, he sold his stock to make hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so he was convicted. Um, he got 24 years and he had to pay out $45 million. Um, but his 24 years got reduced. I'm not certain why, but he was released in 2019. 
just in time to stay home for a year for the pandemic. Um, I don't know what he's doing now. I don't really care. And then Ken Lay, the CEO, he was also charged and found guilty for fraud. Um, but, and this, this makes me so mad. He was, um, released before sentencing and they let him go to his like vacation home in Aspen, Colorado, which if you're not familiar, is a very, very fancy ski resort town. So he goes to his mansion in Aspen where he dies of a heart attack. And so he was never sentenced. Um, so 16 people total went to jail and then there's Ken Lay who didn't go to jail, but would have if he hadn't had a heart attack in Aspen. Okay, but there are more outcomes. They are not, it wasn't just Enron that got in trouble. I've mentioned a few times their um, outside accountants or auditing firm. They used a firm called uh, Arthur Anderson, and at the time it was one of the big five auditing firms. Well, these days people talk about the big four auditing firms because after this, it was such a scandal and it was such misconduct on their part that the company collapsed, that Arthur Anderson does not exist anymore. Um, so, their, yeah, their reputation was completely destroyed and the company collapsed and everyone who worked for them was now out of a job as well. Um, the company itself was convicted of obstructing justice because of the paper shredding I mentioned. Um, but then that was overturned by the Supreme Court on like a weird technicality, but the the blow to its reputation was so bad that that didn't matter. The overturn overturning didn't matter. Like it was it was dead. So Arthur Anderson does not exist anymore. Um, but this relationship between Arthur Anderson, which is an accounting firm, Enron, and the banks as well, the investment banks, is known as synergistic corruption. The bankers, the accountants, the SEC, somebody should have said no to the dubiously illegal or dubiously legal practices, and instead they enabled it at every turn. It was the bankers too. Many of the banks knew about what Fastow was doing, and we know they know because they invested in his SPVs. They gave him money. But nobody said no because they all made money off of it. Um, the investment banks were encouraging them to do a lot of this stuff, and uh, according to some documents, the banks came up with the idea of making loans look like profits. They also um, they also engaged in skeevy illegal schemes like pretending to buy boats from Enron and then giving the boats back to Enron. Well, that's a loan. That's not. Um, that's not what banks do. Banks don't buy oil tankers. You know, they, that's not a thing. They were giving Enron a loan by pretending to buy these tankers. Um, but every time Enron did these things, the banks got fees. People got paid. So, um, and it was the same for the auditors. So the auditors got fees and, you know, if they were doing what Enron wanted them to do, Enron would hire them to be consultants. So they got paid, and they wanted to be consultants for this huge company. Um, so again, this was synergistic corruption, and the banks didn't really get in trouble. I think some people did of the 16 who went to prison, but I, you know, not as much trouble as they should have gotten in. So what about the regular people? Um, the rank and file that I mentioned before. Well, almost 30 people lost their jobs, and that is combined with Enron and... Um, Arthur Anderson. Some of the numbers get confusing here. People say 20,000 people at Enron lost their jobs, but that's not the case. It's a combination of the two companies. Um, more than 20,000 people lost their retirement and pension plans, which was you know, devastating. They worked for this and they were lied to. Um, so eventually the, the employees did sue and they got $85 million dollars um, but that worked out to be about $3,000 a person, which is not a lot, um, not compared to what their pension plans used to be worth. Um, the shareholders also sued, um, and they sued the banks. So while the banks didn't get in as much trouble as they should have, 
This lawsuit was against like the big banks that enabled Enron to do what it did. And so the shareholders got $7 billion. Um, the breakdown of how that money got dispersed is complicated because it involves like 1.5 million people and entities. So like, you know, if your college had invested some of their endowment in Enron, they might have been involved in this lawsuit, for example. So I don't know how much money they would have gotten from the $7 billion or if a single investor invested their savings in Enron. And I don't know, like maybe the employees count in this. I'm not really sure. So this money um, got dispersed somehow. Some of the money I know did come from the money that was um, a penalty for fast hour and skilling. So I do know some of their money went to people, but I, I think that they're still on the hook for some of the money that, like, I think some of it is still happening. Um, I don't know the net worth of these men anymore, if they have any money to take. I mean, if they do, I think that people should take it because it was all ill-gotten and they don't deserve to live rich, fancy lives after what they did because it was all based on crime. Um, and then when it comes to broader impacts on society or American society, one of the really interesting things is, again, this all happened in the fall of 2001. Well, what else happened in the fall of 2001? 9-11. So... After this, the FBI really stopped investigating white-collar crimes, and they moved on to terrorism all day, every day. So there really wasn't, um, like, a big white crime conviction after, like, 16 people. I was really surprised to see that number. Normally, with white-collar crime, you see, like, one, maybe two people. 16 people went to prison for this. But yeah, that's that's why 9-11 happened, and the FBI doesn't really do this anymore. Um, there were new laws passed to try to make this harder to do again. So I'm not sure how to pronounce this. It's the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. It could be Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Um, and this was passed under Bush. It's kind of weak, to be honest. But um, it makes it harder for companies to lie to auditors and it does some other stuff where I think the auditors have to like switch companies after six months like you can't have this long-standing relationship that can be corrupted you know so um that was a sort of broader impacts of Enron just this weird um situation so yeah I think I think one of the reasons that I personally became really interested in this case, in part because it was a mystery for my childhood, just this, this company that I had heard of, I had no idea what they did. Um, turns out nobody knew. Um, and I had no idea why it was illegal or like a big issue. But also, I think um, in this day of corporate greed, it is nice to see people actually face the music for the crimes that they committed, so it's kind of a satisfying story as well. If you made it all the way through this very, very long video, congratulations, um, and do let me know if you're interested in hearing about more white-collar crime. I have um, been watching documentaries and reading up on uh, various crimes committed since 2001, so um, I'd love to do another video like this. Okay.